Weighing everything fairly and evenly, I do feel that Viscera Fest is a good game. I also think it would work better if either the save system were switched to automatic checkpoints or if the difficulty were toned down a couple of notches. But what's here is very well made and actually very good, if not still rough in development and execution. Overall, Viscera Fest gets a 7 out of 10. Well. This is awkward. Sometimes in the course of human events, it becomes necessary to reflect and retract certain statements when new information has come to light or new research has been done. For example, maybe someone, like me, might have been a little too harsh on a game, like Viscera Fest, because I was playing on a difficulty setting that I felt that I could handle, but wasn't respecting the way the game had established its difficulty balancing. Not every game has the exact same difficulty settings or meanings, especially when it comes to how the game specifically has placed and balanced all enemies, weapons, you know what I mean. I mean. And at the same time, sometimes a game sets out to establish a certain tone of difficulty in player agency, like Viscera Fest, by including a save game mechanic in which the player picks up a limited number of save points and can place them wherever they want. Which is great, but if the save beacon pickups are few and far between in a game designed to test player skill, that could lead to some frustration when the player has to backtrack over wide swaths of the game because they haven't found a new save beacon. Long story short, after my review of the first chapter of Viscera Fest, a funny thing happened. I had a lot of interesting conversations with developers Osric and Fireplant Games on the nature of difficulty, saving, player agency, all of that. And despite my frustration with Chapter 1, I couldn't get the game out of my head, and I went back and replayed it just one difficulty setting lower, and suddenly everything clicked. Sure, it was no walk in the park still, but I understood what the game was going for, and I could get through without wanting to tear my hair out constantly. I had plenty of deaths, and also plenty of moments of catharsis, and I felt incredibly sheepish for criticizing a game's difficulty when really, I'd just been trying to play the game the way I felt I could handle it, and not what the game was telling me would be best. But not only that, the devs had rebalanced the save system by adding in just a couple extra save beacon pickups here and there, which made a huge difference. Between that, and my own humility, I was able to recognize Viscera Fest Chapter 1 for what it really is, which is an absolute blast and a masterful story experience that I have now played through several times. And so, Chapter 1, retroactively, gets an 8.5 out of 10. Which finally brings us around to Viscera Fest Chapter 2, which is dropping now close to a year after the game first went into early access back in May 2021. Picking up immediately after the events of Chapter 1, Chapter 2 finds Caroline hot on the trail of Dr. Mortis, which has grown increasingly frustrated with Caroline's interference with well, whatever the hell is going on here in this game, and is basically throwing everything and the kitchen sink into her path in an attempt to slow her down. But Caroline is a single-minded bounty hunter, and she has a bounty to collect, and a ring to buy, and a wedding to get going, and besides, after all the weird shit that happened in the previous chapter, she has a lot of questions that need answering. Answers which sort of come around in this installment. But at the same time, developer Osric has made it very clear here that there's a much bigger story than was even hinted at before, which I will absolutely not spoil here. You know, it's hard to top the plot twist level in the first chapter of Viscera Fest, which was what initially hooked me on playing more of this game, but each new layer of story, each new reveal and turn and answers that only add more questions, I find myself more and more driven to learn more and see more, and while I was intrigued by the events of the game and the character with the new story provided here, I am fully invested in how this is going to wrap up. Viscera Fest being a story-driven game wasn't something I expected back in 2021, nor was I fully prepared for that in 2022, and the notion that it might be another year before we get the final answers is nerve-wracking. I will spoil nothing, I will hint at nothing, I will only say that it is absolutely a story that deserves to go in blind and not know what's coming in order to get the full effect. Meanwhile, since we last played Viscera Fest, there's been a few improvements to the overall gameplay mechanics. First off is the weapon wheel, which, thank Fuck. This is something I didn't even know I needed for this game. Sure, it makes sense in a game like Doom Eternal where if you're expected to run, jump, shoot, dash, the whole nine, you hold a button and a weapon wheel comes up and you pick what you need right then and there. Here, Viscera Fest will stop time so you can select your firearm rather than go into slow motion, which is absolutely necessary because if the game was in slow-mo while you were trying to pick a gun, you'd probably be assaulted by 30 bullets and die. Viscera Fest is and remains a bullet hell movement shooter that asks the player to stay conscious of their surroundings so you'll be running, hopping, dashing, 
shooting and punching your way through level after level like a mad little shotgun toting bunny rabbit. Chapter 2 really highlights the developer's attention to detail and careful placement of both weaponry and supplies, with several areas that will throw multiple enemies at you, sometimes even just one or two, that will initially cause player panic as they dash about hoping not to get caught in the crossfire. But fortunately, the devs don't rely on ammo famine in order to keep the player on their toes. The deliberate and specific placement of ammunition, enemies, and save beacons feels like a living, breathing chessboard and brings to mind games such as Doom, Duke, and Dusk as titles that elevated the genre beyond simple run-and-shoot mechanics. And that's not even discussing the unique stunlock mechanics. If, for example, the plague rifle fires a ball of toxic gas which does damage over time and essentially stuns an enemy in place as it does so. This could open them up for you to use other higher damage weapons in tandem with that, or if you're trying to conserve ammo, you can run up close and hit them with your melee attacks. Other times, with larger enemies like the new mecha scientist, if you time powerful weapon blasts, you can actually cancel out their animations by stunning them for half a second depending on if you know their tells. I was able to do this with the Shambler miniboss as well, which is a brilliant and also tongue-in-cheek tribute to the Eldritch Beast from Quake. We might not agree on whether or not Quake Shamblers are furry, but Viscera Fest Shamblers most certainly are, and I am all about that. Another new feature to the game is the Death Counter, which is... <clears throat> You know, a death counter could get really frustrating and annoying, but when the game tells me I've been capstoned, the cheeky nature is unmistakable, and I can't help but take the piss on that one. Plus, the notion of a death counter is something that more competitive players can get into, promising the notion of an eventual max difficulty zero death run. Jesus Christ, just the thought of that gives me anxiety. Someone's gonna post that on YouTube, and I'm gonna watch the shit out of it. But aside from the weapon wheel and the death counter, there's also been a handful of minor improvements, such as higher quality sprites, new artwork, animations. The devs have clearly Really been hard at work over the last year to put as much polish as possible while working on the new chapter. So with that, let's get into the meat of how Chapter 2 plays and feels. Chapter 2 continues the formula that Chapter 1 so well established. Walk into a room, discover what lies within, get your ass handed to you, reload, walk into the room with new information, conquer, and then make your way to the next area, where you will no doubt die some more until you understand how to get through that one. Much like a thousand and one spikes with tasks you with dying over and over again deliberately as a way of figuring out trap placement and how to navigate a level. Viscera Fest expects you to die, and stacks maps with enemy placement in order to make you think and rethink how to approach a room, all while dying and cursing and cracking your knuckles before giving it one more go. Where Chapter 1 took place on one singular space station and involved navigating narrower corridors and sometimes wider arenas, Chapter 2 expands the battlefield, quite literally, with wide outdoors environments, large facility areas with extra verticality thrown in, even a train level, which now marks the second game this year I've played with a train level, and it absolutely slaps. The mixing up of environments keeps the game feeling fresh, alongside one story-centric level, which doesn't get to be shown here, providing the devs plenty of opportunity to let the maps breathe and speak for themselves without resorting to constant guns blazing gameplay throughout. One moment that stands out to me was a simple puzzle that involved moving a few blocks around so I could get a power coupler into place for an elevator I needed. Chapter 1 had one or two moments where you needed to move a column with a ladder on it into the correct position to be able to move upwards, but not as a puzzle that needed solving. It was a nice touch, very brief and gentle, and didn't affect the flow of the game, was also different enough from the previous chapter that it actually resonated with me. Meanwhile, filling these environments are the game's new enemies, which are fucking brutal. The first chapter introduced us to the drones, which are robots that are normally shielded until they pause for a moment to shoot at you, during which time they are temporarily vulnerable. This time around, we get a new enemy with similar mechanics, the Hellbirds. Hellbirds are Thunderbirds, who resemble avian running backs and charge you for heavy melee damage, but the Hellbirds have the same shields as the drones, which only drop for a moment when they're ready to attack and charge you. Another new enemy is the Arachnospud, which fucking tanks, damage, and fires homing projectiles, which you can easily dodge, but it fires so many of them, and this fucker takes so much damage that it is an immediate threat no matter when or where it appears. And my least favorite, my absolute least fucking favorite of the new bunch, are the Spawnlings. No, 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 please, God, no, fuck! Spawnlings are small, deadly enemies who hop around like crazy whenever they appear, and when they get close enough, they explode in some kind of crystalline ice for a lot of damage, meaning no melee attacks to take them out. Your best bet is to hit them with the shredder pistols and stun lock them into place so they can't keep bouncing at you, and keep your distance when they eventually explode. It's just, it's just kind of, there's a great little balance to the enemies here, because you'll meet a new one and sit forward and think, what are you? Right before you leap backwards in your seat and shout, oh god, no! But no matter how frustrating or nasty some of them can be, there's an element of desire to take 
one more crack at them. To run a combat arena again and do it better, faster, more efficiently, to not let them get the best of you. Helping out are the two new weapons in the game. The Warhound, a grenade launcher that fires a bouncing grenade that then explodes into a group of smaller grenades that all then cluster bomb everything around them. Holy shit, this thing is fucking disgusting. And then, there's the BBQ blaster. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, oh fuck, I'm sorry. This this is so satisfying to use. The BBQ Blaster is the best goddamn flamethrower I've ever used in an FPS. Hands down. It fucking just tears through enemies like absolute judgment, and is one of the best ways to take out the Hellbirds. Both of these weapons are decidedly overpowered, but in ways which force you to think about their usage. Being up close and personal with a large enemy is really not a good idea for using the Warhound, because if you're too close, you can and will die from the resulting grenade umbrella surrounding you. And while the BBQ Blaster does magnificent damage, you do have to get within striking range to use it, because like every flamethrower ever made, you can only shoot it so far. These are essential, and make all of the wild combat encounters even wilder. It's actually kind of neat to think that Viscera Fest's impressive lineup of weaponry could become even more impressive, and we still have one slot on the weapon wheel that will no doubt be revealed with Chapter 3. Okay, so, uh, um, shit, I'm just gushing at this point. There's got, there's gotta be something I can criticize. Oh yeah, here we go. So while most of the game gives very clear direction on which way to go and how to get there, and includes a multitude of secrets which can usually be seen from a distance and give clues as to how to get to them, very rarely does the direction finding make a misstep. And in the few occasions I had troubles, it was due to some of the buttons being very specific about where you needed to click on them. For example, this elevator here has three buttons on it, one of which is lit up, indicating you can use the elevator, but the game wants the player to put the target reticle right on the lit button in order to activate the elevator. Just looking at the set of buttons won't activate it. I, I figured if I just pointed myself at the switches, it would press the correct one for me, but I had to be looking right at the right button, so I ended up wandering off searching for wherever I was supposed to go next, when really I just had to look at the right button and press the use key. This is a minor, minor thing in the grand scheme of the game, but there are a few buttons like this where the game wants you to look at a specific spot rather than just look at the whole switch. Is that a nitpick? Mm, maybe. But as I said, it was a minor thing that only led to me having issues once or twice. One thing that did lead to troubles for me were the guardrails in certain areas, specifically the train, and Carolyn's ability to dash right through them and off into the void, falling to a death that didn't entirely feel like my fault. By nature, Caroline will automatically walk over a railing and continue forward, so if you're dashing back and forth and trying to avoid an enemy in a smaller space surrounded by railings, you could dash right over one without even thinking about it, fall to your death, and there's another notch on the kill counter right before you respawn to dive back into the fray once again. This is another minor thing, but I couldn't help but ball my hands in frustration a couple of times because that damn dash did me dirty and flew me out to die instead of save my ass like I was hoping it would. Some of it was clearly player error, some of it was the nature of the environment, but every time it felt like, uh, uh, can I just stop falling? This RFS movement scheme has always felt a little, well not floaty, but very fast, very light, like there's no inertia or buildup to Caroline's movement. She goes from 0 to 60 in no time, and while I've certainly adjusted to it for the most part, I could definitely feel myself flailing from time to time in super chaotic moments. And when compared to Chapter 1's masterful Elder Banshee boss fight, the fight against Dr. Mortis was a little underwhelming once I understood the mechanics behind it. It was still rough, don't get me wrong, and it was very satisfying to put the hurt to this bastard that we've been chasing for two whole chapters, but it just felt a little bit easier and less demanding than the Banshee. Of course, this is balanced out by the excellent Shambler mini-boss fight, so I'll take what I can get. Despite these, once again, very minor gripes, I have absolutely fallen in love with this game. I feel a little bad, like I ought to be presenting a more critical critique or something, but when a game that I didn't understand or get before can turn me around in such a way for me to not only be looking forward to future content, but to play through it multiple times, really sussing out all the finer details and enemy placement and how to run through it even quicker, I have to give praise where praise is due. This Fest Chapter 2 does exactly what I was hoping it would do. It adds satisfying extra materials while refining what worked before, brilliantly continuing its unique bullet hell experience, and try as I might to stay frustrated at it, I can only shake my head in admiration and awe as I press the reload key and dive back into the mayhem. This Fest Chapter 2 Two gets a 9 out of 10. Well, kids, if you were hoping to get some acerbic wit out of me with this review, I apologize sincerely, but this is a fantastic game so far, and I am thoroughly invested in where it's going to go next. But if you're interested in hearing some wild critiques and clever biting dialogue, <laughs> Oh, you'll probably be very interested in hearing what I have to say about the next game I'm reviewing. Until then, stay hydrated, remember to drop a save beacon if you have more than two on hand, and roll your neck every now and again so you don't carry all your tension there. Stay safe, kids. I'll see you next time.